Do you still remember what your first MySpace song was? Or maybe your first AIM screen name? How about the names of your old Facebook albums where you'd upload, give or take 200 pictures from one night out? Do you remember Rugrats and Hey Arnold, Ringback Tones, the first CD or tape cassette that you bought? If you obsess about all of these very important existential questions, then the Nostalgia podcast is for you. I'm Nicole, host of Nostalgia, where we have deep conversations about superficial things. If you like the pod and want to join us as we unlock major core memories, please subscribe on YouTube, follow on Spotify, and leave a review on Apple Podcasts. I really, really appreciate your support as the show grows. We also have a weekly newsletter with pop culture news, playlists, time capsules, trivia, and more. It's at nostalgia.substack.com. I am so glad you're here and enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Nostalgia. I'm super excited to have K-pop sociology with me here today. You probably know I'm a huge K-pop fan. I'm a big BTS army and we are here today to talk about all things K-pop, its influence. There's just nothing quite like it. So welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Nicole. Like you mentioned, K-pop is so unique. And as someone who was born and raised in Seoul, South Korea for the first portion of my life and, you know, saw K-pop in the 90s, the 2000s, all the way up until now, I'm so excited for our discussion today. Me too. And you have a YouTube channel that really breaks down all the different aspects of K-pop. And I think that being a native South Korean, speaking fluent a native Korean, it just provides this context to so many people because K-pop has this audience that's truly global and it does a really good job of meeting people wherever they're at, no matter what their fluency is in the language, no matter how long ago or how recently they became interested in K-pop. It just is such a welcoming place to people from all different backgrounds to get totally immersed in. Yeah, you said it beautifully. Um, I started my YouTube channel, now expanded onto different platforms like TikTok, Instagram, and um, Twitter. But as someone who is bicultural and bilingual, meaning speaking both languages and understanding both cultures, I feel like, or I hope to, bridge the gap or bring unique perspectives so that both parties can kind of understand different phenomenons. And a lot of the listeners today might know of K-pop as the pop music originating from South Korea. Maybe they've heard of BTS, maybe they've heard of Blackpink, but K-pop has a long, interesting history and understanding the economic, cultural, and historical context of K-pop, I think allows us to not only understand South Korea, but globalization of music, um, content, and fandoms. When was the first time that you really got into K-pop and is K-pop kind of like the default music genre, kind of like how pop is in the U.S. in contemporary times and kind of like how maybe classic rock was like the default back in uh, closer to mid-century? Like, what is that like in your developing and evolving introduction to music? Yeah, that's such a good question. I remember my first impression of K-pop was through TV in the 90s. There are three major kind of broadcasting stations in Korea, and each of them has a music show. So, um, you know, I think it's either Thursday, Friday, Saturday, each of the three broadcasting stations hosts like an hour or an hour and a half where all these artists come and perform live and they pick like the first uh or number one artist of the week. And I remember the colorful lighting, the synchronized dancing. I think that's a very key trait in K-pop. And in the 90s, it was a very uh, disco-inspired kind of heart-thumping hits that really gets you excited. I remember seeing blonde dyed hair and English lyrics for the first time in the 90s, and I was mesmerized. I was sold. I was like, what is this? Um, I feel like in the 90s, there was a lot of 
like musical diversity, but the beginning of K-pop is credited to Seo t a e j i and the Boys in 1992. Since then, we've seen、um, a more curated or polished or trained version of these. Boy groups, girl groups, and co-ed groups coming out with their songs, and I would say now、um, into 2022, K-pop is a pretty dominant kind of genre. But in the 90s, not so much. I think really in the 2000s is when the fandoms really took off. A lot of people think about K-pop in four generations: 90s kind of being the first generation, early 2000s being the second generation, 2010s kind of being the third generation. I think we're now in the fourth generation. And I know Nicole,、um, we chatted a little bit about this, but I'd love to hear your first introduction or impression of K-pop too. Yeah, absolutely. So I have a friend who is South Korean and bicultural, and she. She showed me the song "Party" by Girls' Generation, yes, and it is just the most feel-good song ever. It's a it's a song of the summer, and even in the music video, the girls take a flight, and they're on the beach, and just this vibe of like going on vacation and having some cocktails by the pool and、mm-hmm. being with all of your friends, and the song is just so. High energy and high vibe. I'm like, I'm straight up obsessed with this song, and <laughs> I don't know what any of it says, but I love it, and I've listened to it probably thousands of times since. And that was my first impression was just that it's fun, and we've definitely had some of the. Definitely, some of the influence in just like the Hello Kitty kind of aesthetic, and、mm-hmm. people kind of taking motifs and themes that are super popular in Asia, and us seeing them applied and interpreted in the U.S. market. But it wasn't until my sister got me into BTS at the beginning of the pandemic, where、That's、I、right. really, really went down the rabbit hole and. The difference here between oh, this is just a, a super fun song with a good beat and just the sense of like happiness behind it.、Mm-hmm. BTS definitely was more real, I guess, and just looking up the translations of their lyrics and seeing that these themes are about problems that you face. And whether that's not feeling like you're enough, or not feeling、mm-hmm. okay, or just kind of dealing with the challenges of not having autonomy、mm-hmm. as a young person, and I think that with the pandemic, we kind of all felt like that. There's this feeling of things are out of our control, and I say that BTS single-handedly lifted my depression because I just had this sense of. Belonging that I now fully understand that K-pop does for people, and that's ultimately why I do what I do too—to bring people together, to make them feel like they're a part of something. And I think that that's what K-pop and that's what fandom does as well, because people in this audience, yes, they are fans. Yes, they're an、mm-hmm. audience of this particular musician or musical group. But ultimately, they relate to one another too, and so that is what really inspired me to start making TikTok videos that were inspired、mm-hmm. by BTS, and that was just such a joy because they they got a huge response, and seeing people comment from all over the world, and I would ask questions like, "Have you ever met a friend through Army? Have you ever、mm-hmm. connected or reconnected with someone in your family through BTS's music?" How much would you pay for BTS concert tickets? Someone said they would sell their husband, which was my favorite response. <laughs> Everything you own, <laughs> they're like the limit does not exist. I would do anything, <laughs> but it, it does. It becomes a whole new culture and language. And I mean, I'm just I'm beyond grateful for having discovered them because seeing people who. And granted, there's two sides of this. They've been filmed doing literally everything from eating to sleeping to the most <laughs> innocuous things. But seeing somebody and kind of having 
it is a parasocial relationship. So Mm -hmm. of course you don't know the person firsthand, but it's like seeing so many different sides of this one person. We see these idols more up close and personal than we often do people that we know in our own lives. And I think that's what makes that relationship so strong and so powerful that maybe when you feel like you don't have a voice or you don't feel connected to people or you don't really feel understood being a part of this fandom helps do that for you. You said it so well. I would say it's like a unifying force. And if I were to draw a Venn diagram between the music that you really like, the lyrics, the messaging, um, the fancy dancing, (laughs) whatever, um, and the person um, or the artist themselves, I would say, and feel free to disagree, in other kind of musical genres, maybe you like the music And, you know, you appreciate the person, but in K-pop, I think the Venn diagram is so close. You like the music, therefore you like the artist. You like the artist, therefore you like the music. It's kind of like a positive feedback loop. And what you mentioned about um, kind of finding connection and belonging and a sense of community through fandoms, I 100% agree. It's almost like you share these core values, whether it's the love yourself messaging through a lot of BTS's songs or kind of, um, you know, criticism of certain societal functions through more kind of bold messaging for certain other groups. I know Satoji and the boys were very, very, um, got their initial fandom because a lot of people were discontent, especially with the economic situation in the 90s in Korea. Um, the messaging, as well as the artist, as well as the music, it's all kind of merged into one. Yeah, I definitely agree. And the way that there's that connection between the fandom and the artist is the really closest example I can think of is Taylor Swift and Swifties. Mm-hmm. Because you can think even Lady Gaga, Ariana Grande, like the level of closeness that their fans feel to the human themselves mm-hmm. is nowhere near anything that I've seen in K-pop before because in American culture, we kind of worship the celebrity. Mm-hmm. And I think that's something very interesting to deconstruct and I mean, that's kind of what this podcast is about. It's deep conversations about superficial things. And the idea is that we are not fixated on the celebrity themselves or gossip about the celebrity or whatever. We're focused on us and how how this celebrity or how the popular culture mm-hmm. influenced us, not just as consumers or fans or audience members or people who buy albums no but as people as well and i think that's a really important distinction to make that although the fans do hold the power and that they have buying power they can make these companies or break these companies in a a financial aspect and i think word travels so fast with social media too but ultimately there's just there's more humanity behind it than i've ever Mm -hmm. seen in the music industry before Yeah, that's a good point. I think bringing this back to the 90s and the early 2000s, every fandom in K-pop has a unique name that's usually associated with the artist's name. So I joined the Jumping Boa fandom, which is the group or the fans that support Boa, um, an solo female artist from SM Entertainment. And each fandom also has a unique color associated with them. So in the 90s and the 2000s, we didn't have fancy light sticks that were LED and connected to our smartphones. (laughs) Those didn't exist. Everyone had balloons that represented your artist's colors. And you, you know, this kind of speaks to how right now, I think there are hundreds of girl groups and boy groups who debut each year in 2000. In 21 and 2022, but in the 90s, the number was not as high, so everyone could pick a color. <laughs> there was enough <laughs> colors to go around. So yellow represented BOA, um, white represented HOT, um, light blue represented GOD. So if you go to concerts, everyone had their balloons and represented kind of their fandoms. What do you think when you hear that shaking balloons at concerts? That's so fun, actually. And I think that that's really funny because it's just part of the transition, right? It's like, Mm -hmm. we didn't always have cell phones, the technology enabled experience. And 
I just I get nostalgic when I look back on something like that because it just seems so pure and coming from the right place and with a good intention. Yeah, I think another interesting phenomenon um, is merch or merchandise associated with your artists. These days, you see everything from, you know, toothbrushes to mugs and t-shirts and, you know, the companies produce them. But back in the 90s, these fandoms would self-organize and create their own signs and create their own, I think a fan to literally like fan yourself in the heat um, was another very popular item. Um, In school, you, okay, now this is going to sound real old, but in the (laughs) 90s, um, not everyone got new books in school. Sometimes you got hand-me-down books from the grade above and you had these book protectors or they're kind of like vinyl or plasticky thin materials that you put on top of your book cover so that doesn't wear out and you can pass it down to the next generation. Again, dating me a little bit, but (laughs) that book cover you can buy with pictures of your favorite artist. So pencil cases, book covers, um, kind of stationery were another popular merch from the 90s that I remember. That is so fun did you did people put up posters on their walls yes posters were popular i remember cds also you know how in the you know the what is it called the lyric book or like the little booklet in the front Mm -hmm. i remember just reading through every lyric and listening and singing along to the cds um nowadays i feel like k-pop fandoms buy cds not to listen to the CD because streaming is so common now, but because um, the CDs have themselves have become part of the merch, um, the mm-hmm. fancy kind of packaging, the elaborate, you know, close to a 100 page photo book that you get to keep. So less for the music, but album sales, because it's so important when you um, when it comes to metrics for music charts are still so high for K-pop groups because they've reimagined what CDs represent. I remember my very first CD was um, Lee Jonghyun and Wa. This is from 1990 something. Um, and she had a microphone at the edge of her pinky. And that was like a cool phenomenon back then. Do you remember your favorite or first kind of CD from the 90s? Yes. So my first cassette tape that I bought, with, I guess with my own money, was Spice World by <gasps> Spice Girls. And the first CD that I bought, it was at this store called Strawberries, and it was Mariah Carey's Music Box. Oh my yeah, gosh. Which I loved. And I don't remember whether that was before or after I received Celine Dion's Let's Talk About Love CD. But I mean, it was just, it's it's pretty clear. That was like my, my top three, like my trifecta <laughs> of my own emerging music tastes. Mm. Whereas when I grew up, I was, Queen was my favorite band. I would listen to Queen and the Beatles and all of my parents' music. And then when I truly, I guess when I was around, six or seven and got to explore Mm. a little bit of my own music taste with contemporary artists you know growing up I'd never listened to artists who were from my generation or from Mm -hmm. you know they hadn't released music or had been in the peak of their popularity before I was born Mm -hmm. the first time I got to experience a phenomenon in real time was Spice Girls and I think that that sense of belonging of like, wow, I get to have ownership over something. Like Mm. I get to be like, this is like my music. Yeah. Yeah. And just the fact that they were super extra and unapologetic and themselves. And I mean, to whom is the message of girl power more appealing than a young girl, you know? Yeah. Wow. I think um, bringing this almost kind of full circle or making a connection to something you said earlier is Spice Girls and Girls' Generation or Sonia the party song that you listened to in 2015, mm-hmm. are I think in the top 10, you know, top grossing girl group concerts of all time. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, start, started with the Spice Girls. Here we are with Girls' Generation. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I love seeing how I, I did an episode about girl bands not too long ago. I listened to was, it. Thanks. There was another, I can't remember what they're called. I'm sure you would know, but they're like the top selling South Korean girl band it wasn't girls generation it was someone a little bit more recently maybe more Espa? in the late oh no i don't know it was in like the late Twice? 2000s it... i don't remember i'm gonna have to look it up and <laughs> tell you because it was incredible to see the reach and mm -hmm. i think that's an interesting concept too because with k-pop groups they're designed to be exported much mm -hmm. like j-pop groups too where behind the united states japan is like the biggest music market in the world right. so you know you're making music to be exported and so i think that that's really interesting how do you think that that purposeful globalization of k-pop how do you think it affects the music the fact that it is truly meant to be a commodity that's bought and sold yeah i think that's a really interesting point because not a lot of people know that there is a branch of the korean government um i don't know the exact transition in english it's basically like culture and culture and contents is the rough translation and they fund and encourage and create laws that are friendly to producing content that's made for global consumption um, and the rigorous kind of training system where boys and girls would audition and they would um, get singing lessons, dancing lessons, language lessons, manner lessons, instrument lessons in order to come out as a polished kind of girl group or a boy group. Um, that kind of meticulous training process, I think, is probably shaped by the large global market that K-pop is aiming for. Um, the increase in English lyrics and incorporating non-Korean members, I think, started in the 2000s. It's a lot more common now, I think, are ways that they appeal to a broader audience because language barriers, music transcends language barriers for sure. But when it comes to interviews, when it comes to making a genuine connection, waiting for the subtitles can be a little bit hard. So I think Blackpink is a really good example of how Jenny, who grew up in Australia and um, Lisa, who's from Thailand, and Chisu, who's like just truly Korean, and Rose, who's from New Zealand, or maybe New Zealand and Australia it might be flipped. I apologize, but um, those girls are native or very, very fluent in English as well as Thai, mm -hmm. um, appeal to a global audience. So the training system, as well as um, just recruiting members who represent a more diverse background, I think are some trends that we're seeing. Yeah, I absolutely love Blackpink. Do you have a yes. favorite member? It's hard to pick favorites, but when I saw their, when I attended their 2019 world tour, um, and when I got to hear Jenny rap in person, I fell in love for Jenny even more. But I love all four members. Do you have a favorite? It's hard because, okay, did you watch their documentary on Netflix? I did. Yeah. So I love that. And it just, it makes you kind of partial to everybody. But I think maybe I'm most like Lisa, probably. Mm-hmm. <laughs> The positivity and uplifting other people and encouraging them or the fabulous dancing or maybe both <laughs> thank you okay i looked it up it's two anyone is that how you say it 21 21 yeah oh my gosh my heart is so warm the it's four so girls <laughs> wikipedia this is not scientific fact but wikipedia says they've sold over 66 million records which is comparable to TLC, which yeah. is the only, which is number two behind Spice Girls in mm -hmm. girl bands of the um, latter half of the 21st or latter half of the 20th century. Wow. I feel like yeah. 21 
broke a lot of stereotypes in K-pop. Um, one of them being that girl groups have to be cute or sexy, but they came out with a girl crush strong female representation concept. Um, also, in terms of outfits, I feel like clothes play also a really important part in creating someone's image. Um, before 21, a lot of the girl groups wore similar clothes, but 21 had individual styling. So maybe the colors matched, but, you know, CL will be wearing like a silver vest with striped tights, but Minji will be wearing like a dress or something like that. The four girls are so iconic. They actually um, performed at Coachella, I think, earlier this year. CL, the leader, got all four of them together. So if you liked K-pop in the second generation, kind of 2010 era, um, everyone kind of screamed for seeing all four of them together. That's amazing. Do you think that there's different pressures being a girl group versus being a boy group or you know or even a co-ed group what does that look like yeah really good question i could talk about this for hours there's definitely a double standard when it comes to boy groups and girl groups what they can do what they cannot do i think girl groups are a lot more prone to rumors or comments or just rudeness when it comes to physical appearance regarding their weight, regarding the relationship within the members. I think there's a lot more sensitivity there. Co-ed groups were a lot more common in the 90s, like Cool, Sharp, um, Coyote are three of my favorite co-ed groups from the 90s. But in the as these double standards kind of became even more extreme in the 2000s. We're seeing less and less of them now. Card, K-A-R-D, um, who produced K-pop songs with Latin influence or Latin kind of beats is the only kind of co-ed group that I can think of that are active now in 2022. Um, and I think it's because of the double standards. Um, the girl groups are usually marketed towards a male audience while the boy groups are usually marketed towards a female audience. Again, more heteronormative kind of stereotypes and assumptions here, but um, putting that detail aside. And there are more female K-pop fans than male K-pop fans when it comes to numbers. But when it comes to buying power, it depends on what age you're talking about. So I think some of the demands from the consumers maybe shape some of the pressures, but being a K-pop girl group seems really hard. Lots of scrutiny and um, yeah, the image that you have to portray as a humble, quiet, almost kind of a polished kind of image seems really hard. Yeah. Do you think that that kind of pressure is going to change as the globalization of K-pop continues? Because I've even started to see now some of the overlay of American values on top mm -hmm. of K-pop, where it's like, if you understand Korean culture, you understand why people carry themselves in a certain way or why they don't speak about people the way that, you know, gossip magazines or stuff would speak about them here. Um, even with the, the greater amount of English lyrics, even just seeing a little bit of the backlash from ARMY being like, no, we like you because you're, mm. you're Korean and because you're doing K-pop, we don't want you to just become pop, you know, like how, where do we kind of draw that line? And like, yes, maybe we would like to see some of the practices, especially with the training process. And because nothing like that really truly exists in the same way mm -hmm. in putting these trainees through this grueling process. I think Jenny said in the documentary, she was training for like six years before their debut. And it's like with the concern with their mental health and their psychological safety, like yet with the same, again, that kind of putting our American values of like, make money, do more, be bigger. Those are conflicting. Like, how do you think mm -hmm. that's going to play out with the fourth generation of K-pop. Yeah, I feel like um, authenticity is something that people these days, consumers and fans these days want to see more of. And K-pop idols are human too. They make mistakes, they have opinions, they change over time. Um, 
one area where I see a little bit more openness or kind of a trend towards more authenticity, we're still very, very far, but I think our um, conversations around mental health and dating openly. I don't know what it's like. I feel like it's a little bit more lenient in the US, but still a lot of scrutiny. But in K-pop, dating rumors are a big no-no. Um, there's almost this kind of expectation or narrative that as a K-pop artist, you are in love with your fans or you are dedicated and committed towards your fans. And dating with dating rumors in general can kind of damage your reputation or damage this ideal perception that fans have that they are reserved kind of for you. You understand, right? It's a little bit harder oh, yeah. to translate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I understand. Right. It might be a concept that sounds so weird. Foreign, yeah. To people actually, because I think the opposite kind of happens here where there are PR relationships in the US where people who are not really dating, but it's like they're both starring in a movie that happens yes. to be coming out next month. If anything, in the US, people are together because the relationships fuel the press and the rumors fuel the press. Whereas it is kind of like the inverse in K-pop culture because you don't want to be involved mm -hmm. with anybody else because the perception needs to be that you are always available to your fans because your fans your fans are the loves of your life that's and right, that's, that's the right. source of your energy that's right and you know during interviews some of the k-pop idols often get this question of you know who is your ideal kind of um type of a romantic partner and a very kind of generic textbook a plus answer is oh i love my fans and um i don't know how authentic that will sound it is nice to hear so i you know i understand both sides but hyona who debuted as the wonder girls and then for a minute and is now a strong female solo artist is dating and is engaged to ton from pentagon he's not with pentagon anymore he's a solo artist now but i feel like she's definitely breaking the stereotype and k-pop idols as they write more of their lyrics are talking about their experiences so this is a trend i hope to see a little bit more of and then on the notion of mental health i think artists like bts does a really good job of shining light to some of the more you know mental health unfortunately is sometimes a little bit stigmatized still to this day so shining light on those important issues and unfortunately we lost some k-pop idols to um suicide and just the gruesome pressure of being in the industry. So I think um, there are certain laws in place to punish or identify early kind of the people who say very malicious comments or spread false rumors. So we have a long way to go on both the dating openly and being human as a K-pop artist, as well as um, just shining light and talking more about mental health. Some progress, but more more progress to be made. Yeah, something that I think that K-pop does that I really don't think is the norm necessarily in the music industry is that the fans really allow the artist to grow and to progress and to change. And I think that because they're packaged as eras, there's almost the expectation that, okay, next era or the comeback as it's referred to, like it's going to be a little bit different, whether it's kind of like an overarching theme, their mm -hmm. style of dress, we're expecting constant innovation. Whereas I think that in a Western market, sometimes that's shunned, where if an artist tries to move from one genre to another, or they have even a different haircut, or a different look, everyone's like, whoa, this is mm -hmm. a lot. And I think what I appreciate about K-pop is that if the artists want to do something new, even with J-Hope going solo, mm -hmm. people are just happy for the idols. And of course, nothing that idols do is is not met with some small percentage of backlash just because they're so, so famous. But I do really appreciate seeing that kind of support in that, you know what? If they need to announce whatever kind of hiatus, if it's for their mental health, if it's mm -hmm. because we love each other essentially and that this is something we're doing to be better, 
and they're they're so completely earnest about mm-hmm. like we don't want to disappoint you i think that that kind of sense of responsibility is something that you don't see with western artists too maybe they are removed from the spotlight because they I don't know, had to go to rehab or something. It's not because they genuinely want to be a better person for their fans, but at least in BTS, I've seen where they truly want to be the best, not just idols, but humans that they can possibly be. And I really appreciate that. That's so beautifully said. I think on supporting the artist and wanting them wanting genuine happiness for them comes from the point that we made earlier about how we care not only about their music, but themselves as artists and as human beings and because fans have huge buying power and they are supportive of the artists either taking a break or exploring a new genre or you know whatever it takes for their genuine happiness um there are financial incentives for the companies the record labels to prioritize that as well and on on the notion of innovation i think storytelling um or some sort of I like to think of it as a universe, like K-pop is a universe, each K-pop artist is a universe, and um, each era or each comeback or each album tells a different facet of that universe, and it all kind of connects, but they're different at the same time, just makes it a world that's so fun to be around. Yeah, I agree. And I have one last question for you, just kind of like the perception of, so we talked about how you are bilingual and bicultural. And I've seen with ARMY how it is literally, first of all, it's a full-time job to be in a fandom. That's right. (laughs) Right. But also there are native speakers who are truly volunteers in translating this material because we do have a constant influx of new content that is translated for a global audience. Mm -hmm. I think that, I think that maybe you can be bicultural without necessarily being bilingual, but if you are bilingual, you are bicultural. Um, Because I feel like that's some people's hesitation in getting into K-pop or they feel like, oh, well, I'm an army, but like, I, but like, oh, not, I don't Mm -hmm. know as much as somebody else. And I do think that there's critical sociopolitical context that, a native person would just inherently know over someone who has not been immersed in the culture or firsthand grew up in the culture. What do you think about that kind of relation between still being able to be immersed in a world if that's not necessarily something that is native to you? Yeah, I think um, for me as someone who is who happened to be born in Seoul, South Korea, and understand maybe, I think, bullying and going to the military as like mandatory service are two prime examples of, it's just really hard to explain all the complexities of what that means in Korea and outside of Korea. Uh, but anyways, I think for me, I started with Korean culture and then got into K-pop. For those who got into K-pop and maybe feel a little bit less confident about understanding fully Korean culture. I think it's definitely a process and there are so many resources online. And if you're already a K-pop fan and a dedicated K-pop fan, you probably know a lot more about Korean culture and language than you might be giving yourself credit for. So as you said, K-pop fandoms are a very welcoming, inclusive community. So I encourage anybody who's listening, who's kind of curious about K-pop to dive in. We welcome you with open arms. Um, I think I have in my YouTube channel, I have these series called K-pop basic lessons, and it goes through some of the cultural context behind the building blocks of K-pop. So hopefully that will be educational material, but I know lots of people who learn the Korean language or visit Korea after getting into K-pop, and that makes your cultural and linguistic experiences even more fulfilling and um, fun. That's amazing. And I highly recommend your YouTube channel too, because all the videos, they're pretty short too. They're short videos. So everything is so, it's so digestible. And I mean, there's a whole, there's a whole, not just a podcast episode, but a whole podcast can be about challenging the stereotypes behind 
you know, who is involved in K-pop fandoms. It's for people of all ages, all genders, all backgrounds and walks of life. And I think the fact that, like you said, it is a unifying force. It's the greatest. K-pop is for anybody and everybody, and we welcome you with open arms. I think your um, diverse music taste and your ability to connect themes is something that I've admired listening to your past episodes, and this has been so, 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 so fun. Thank you so much for being here. And yeah, that just about wraps it up. Thank you, K-pop Sociology, and make sure to follow her YouTube channel, and we will see you next week. Thank you so much, Nicole. Thanks so much for having me. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye.